Good evening, I'm Henry Newfeld of Energion Publications, uh, although tonight I'm teaching on my uh, personal channel, the one I share with my wife, Jody Newfeld, and we're also cross-posting to the Chemekla Community Church uh, page as a uh, virtual uh, Wednesday night study. Just a couple of housekeeping items here. Uh, one, I am watching uh, the comments. If you want to make a comment, if you want to ask a question, add something to the study, feel free to do so uh, via Facebook, and I will be uh, I will be looking at those, and uh, we'll try to bring them in uh, if at all possible. We're not working against a particular deadline. Uh, I hope that each one of these studies will have material in it that is is a value on its own, uh, but the study itself. Uh, can extend for a very long time. One of the things I do not try to do is provide a you know five minute or three minute or any short uh, you know daily Bible study. Uh, I'm here to talk about going uh, somewhat uh, going deeper in the Word, uh, studying, and uh, trying to uh, to learn more. In the Scriptures are there are many things that. Uh, uh, that are quite simple and straightforward, but there are also many things that are uh, quite complicated uh, or complex, and they're intended for to uh, help us grow. So uh, let me continue here with just a little bit in terms of the uh, uh, the housekeeping. First of all, I blog at uh, Threads for Henry's Web. I put up the uh, uh, the URL there to go to that blog, and on there I do some uh, uh, background, some additional information, things that I don't intend to uh, spend time on in the study, and then there's always uh, worthwhile uh, looking at uh, the resources for studying Paul, which is on um, also on my site, which has books, previous interviews, uh, and previous episodes, uh, and uh, I'm doing a series of Who Was Paul interviews. Uh, yesterday I interviewed Dr. Alan Bevere. He's a United Methodist pastor in uh, Ohio and uh, has talked, uh, has done a great deal of study of Paul. He uh, wrote the uh, uh, study guide in our Energion Publications participatory study series on Colossians and Philemon. And uh, so that's that. Uh, that book is uh, available. But also, this is a 30-minute interview in which he answers the 10 questions I had set out uh, about uh, what Paul was like as a person. What's Paul's background? Where does he go uh, for? Uh, where does he go for his own uh, sources? Uh, that have formed him and so on. And so it's a helpful set of interviews with some different perspectives uh, and people uh, for people to look at. Now as we come in here today, uh, last week we ended up at the end of Genesis 1. Uh, and so there God was telling the human beings that he had created uh, that they would have dominion over the earth and so on. And I pointed out that you know, law goes beyond uh, restricting certain activities. It also goes to the point of granting uh, certain authority, granting certain power to people. And so that happens in Genesis 1. Uh, and so I'm going to start from there because we, we're going to look at Genesis 2 where suddenly we see uh, another uh, kind of law uh, taking place. And so give me a moment here to start my uh, slideshow and uh, we'll uh, bring that on. This is uh, our session October 7th and uh, let's get this moving here. And so this was the scripture on which we ended last week. Uh, and you notice there that you have a you have some mandates, you also have some authority uh, that is delegated. Now Genesis 1 
is a vigorous expression of God's glory and God's authority. Uh, it's uh, the emphasis of Genesis 1 is God is powerful, his word is effective, everything is created uh, very uh, uh, without any sort of a conflict as you might have seen in other creation stories. I'll come to that in a minute. Now when we go into Genesis 2, from which I'm showing the text right now, you go into Genesis 2 and everything gets less of a focus on uh, the power and the distance. There you, you feel God proclaiming, uh, you know, more or less out of the clouds or as it come, happens later in Exodus off the top of the mountain uh, proclamation in Genesis 1. Uh, there is there's no conflict in the story. It simply proceeds as God does what it was each day. It was so. God saw that it was good. Boom, 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 and the whole thing finishes. Now he takes the way the creation of the human being in Genesis 2 is described is he, the human being is formed from the dust of the ground and then God breathes into him the breath of life. So you now have a human being who is a living uh, creature. And then you have this personal attention like God plants a garden, God looks for a helper uh, for Adam because he sees that he needs it. He goes with Adam and as they name the creatures uh, and, uh, and so on. So you have this very personal outlook. And this can give us an illustration of how it is that we need to uh, study scripture uh, in order to come up with, uh, shall we say, a more general uh, doctrine. Very often you, people read one verse and say, this is what the Bible says, you know, it's God said it, I believe it, that settles it. The problem is that when you do it that way, you might be believing uh, something that's not quite so. For example, if you read just Genesis chapter 1, uh, and you ignore Genesis chapter 2, you may believe in a God who is powerful uh, and is the creator, but is also distant. If you read Genesis 2, uh, you are likely to see a very different kind uh, of a picture of God. Uh, and uh, we'll say uh, a bit more about that in a minute. But so here we have, now we have this uh, law comes up, and notice the word law isn't here. Word studies are good. I gave the links last week, uh, and they're still they're on the, my blog at Threads for Henry's uh, web. They're still, uh, word studies help us a great deal, but you may find something out from, about the law in Scripture by finding actual laws and they may not be identified as such. As a matter of fact, I would call the passage we just read in Genesis a little bit earlier, that's law giving. But what it is, is a grant of authority uh, and a certain amount of direction with that authority. Uh, and so allow your concept of law in scripture to be expanded. Uh, a lot of the time we think of law as the Ten Commandments, which is mostly prohibitions, don't do this, don't do that although there are some positives in there, such as uh, the Remember the Sabbath Day uh, commandment. Uh, but a lot of the commandments are prohibitions, and so we think of law in just that way. Uh, but it is a broader, more flexible concept uh, than that. So now here we have the human beings have been given a mandate They've now been put in a garden where, you know, to uh, take care of that garden. Uh, and so we have, you may eat from any tree in the garden, he, that is God, told the man, except from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat from that, you are surely doomed to die. Now, there's a lot of debate about, you know, what the tree represents. Is there a literal tree in the literal garden? Is this a symbol of some other thing? Uh, let me put it this way, whether it's a literal tree in a little gar literal garden or a, uh, uh, a symbol of something else, it does at least symbolize something, which is the same God who is able to create, the same God who is able to give the, uh, the human family 
a mandate, give the human family authority and direction, that same God also had the authority to say no on certain things. And so this says uh, the couple uh, have limitations on their actions. You know, will they stay within those boundaries, whatever those boundaries uh, may in fact have been? So uh, taking a look here and see if we have anybody in the comments. And I don't see anybody in the comments, uh, so we'll continue here uh, from this. All I'm interested in here right now is two things. God establishes the authority. God gives a mandate. Uh, and then we add the factor of law uh, that God makes a prohibition. Now, again, there's a lot of debates about details as you get into Genesis 3. But in Genesis 3, we find that the human beings do not stay content within the limitations that, that God has placed on them. One of the things we tend to do, and it leads us into trouble, is to emphasize uh, the negatives, emphasize the negative aspect of law and command. Now, while I'm at this, let me uh, reference a book. This will be linked if somebody wants to look at it in the catalog. This is something that I wrote up. It's translation, Genesis uh, uh, 1 and 2, uh, end of the flood stories looking at uh, these different sources. You'll hear source criticism talks about uh, where something came from. If I'm sitting down with a manuscript and I have pieces, even if they're, say, different pieces that I may have written at different times, I put them together into a single story that I'm bringing sources together. Redaction is what scholars use uh, for a, a longer word to mean edit. Uh, which is how things are put together. People ask this question about Genesis 1 and 2. They sound very different. The stories tell a different story. And that's all I'm interested in for our study right now. But I want to refer you to this if you want to look a little bit more at how these stories uh, mesh together, how they work together. And that would be uh, this little book right here. Like I said, this PowerPoint will be uh, embedded on uh, Henry's threads, the threads from Henry's web uh, that I provided the uh, link for earlier. So you can take a look uh, with it in some of the, uh, uh, as, as how those go together. For right now, what I want us to realize is we get two different views, and we don't want to call our response biblical when we've missed part of it. Uh, two things you have to be careful is, one is, don't miss the way stories are meshed together. That happens here when people say Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are so different, and so they must come from different sources which is fine, except that somebody saw them working together and here came Genesis 1 and 2 as a single text. What does it mean when they come together? All of this then is part of our canon of scripture and we have another term called canonical criticism, which is let's look at what all of this is doing in the whole canon of scripture. And all of these different approaches and elements go into our understanding of scripture. Learn to understand both the, the differences and the key elements of a story and the connections. Either You skip either of those two things and you'll get uh, a difficult answer. I always talk about this when, uh, you know, in like English 101, a lot of times in college, you'll be given a comparison and contrast. If you compare two things and you look only at the things that are similar, you can get a false idea of connection. And if you look only at the things that are different, you can make them sound like they're completely opposed. And it's a tension between understanding what's the same and what's different. And how does that work here? In Genesis 1, we have the authority and the distance. In Genesis 2, we have uh, the personal uh, connection uh, in the activity. Now, how those two stories came to be and how they came together, that's an interesting study in itself, and that's why I put up the book. 
So now let's uh, get into this talking about law, and you may wonder why I've gone to a nifty stock uh, photo of uh, looks like a dad with his son uh, looking out over the mountains and over a cliff. But I want us to look here. We're going to come back to how this relates to Genesis in a minute. Let's think about this dad out there with his, uh, with his son uh, and what instructions the dad may be giving to the son. He's, why is he, does he have this child uh, in the mountains with him? Well, probably uh, this is his son. He wants to uh, teach him. He wants to... Uh, you know, help him to grow. He's doing good things, spending time uh, with the child. Has he probably given some prohibitions here? Yes, he's probably said, you know, uh, hold my hand in certain circumstances. Uh, don't go over the cliff. Uh, you know, don't get too close to the edge of the cliff. Take care with, you know, loose rocks. There's any number of instructions that the father might have given. Now, Would we suppose that what the son needs to do is follow all of those instructions, instructions so that his father will love and appreciate him? Well, actually, if we've worked with children at all, if children of our own, grandchildren, uh, we probably think that what I'm suggesting right there that sounds pretty ridiculous. No, it's really the opposite. The father has given those instructions because this is his child. He has given those instructions because he already loves his child. And the child can keep them both because he trusts his parent and also because he can see uh, the validity. And as he grows, the, there will be differences in the way he sees that. Now let's, uh, well, really, if I step back in the slide, let's tie this back to Genesis uh, 1. I'm going to go all the way back, and then we'll jump forward again. What happens here is God gives a mandate, and then as we go here, God gives restrictions. But he doesn't do this in order that you will be the people that I created, the people that I want to have fellowship with. Rather both the mandate, uh, the, uh, the mandate, the authority uh, that is delegated to them, and the command, the negative command, comes out of the fact that God has created them and that they are God's people. And these are the ways that God who created them wants them to behave. This gets us into a principle. I've heard it said a number of ways. My professor uh, he taught me Hebrew, Alden Thompson, used to always say, grace comes before law. Uh, and I don't have a slide for it, but uh, you know I can illustrate it here. Say, well, how is grace before law in this picture? Well, God first creates. He says, here you are. Here you have a world. Here you have a place to live Or in Genesis 1. In Genesis 2, here you have a garden that I have planted for you to take care of. So, Here's some things to do. The gift comes first. If you want to illustrate it more closely, you go to Genesis 20 and the Ten Commandments where it starts out, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The grace has come through. If we go back to the beginning of Exodus, we find that the people of Israel uh, don't even know the name of God that they're calling on. God hears them cry out. God comes to save them. Uh, many of them fuss, uh, and uh, please let's not look at the uh, at these people of Scripture and think that we'd be doing better, uh, because uh, most of us will complain uh, if there's any difficulty along the way of coming to freedom, and there always is. So they, here they've had the difficulty, they've been brought out, they've been brought through the Red Sea. Uh, God has provided uh, water from the rock, God has provided manna. Here you are at Mount Sinai, and the commandments start out, though, I'm the Lord your God who did all of this. Now, here's some, some commands. The, the people are God's people before they are given 
the commands. And the thing that's interesting here is, as well, and I'm going to bring this in uh, now because it's kind of pointing forward uh, to what I'll talk about later, creation also tells us that um, we are completely subject to God. Every, everything comes from God. That's what you should see in Genesis 1, where right from the ground up, everything comes according to God's word. Uh, so Psalm 104 uh, reemphasizes it, but I won't go there right now. But in, in every breath comes from God. So people who talk about, can I earn God's favor by doing something, should realize you can't even breathe. You can't take your next breath without God. Uh, and so that's going to come through. Now let's come back here. So again, this is the lesser to the greater. The father loves his son, and therefore there are certain things that he is doing. Uh, you know, he is, so the child is not going to earn his father's love by failing to step on loose rocks and slide off the edge of the cliff. That is the benefit of having a loving father who provides those kinds of limitations that go on. Uh, now, if you look at this, if that law is reversed, if you're feeling that the law is given for the purpose of restricting you and forcing you to earn, whether that is your parents' affection, your teacher's affection, uh, a mentor's affection, your parents, whatever it is, if you reverse that law, it's going to become a curse. And that's really clear, I think, right here in Genesis. Now we're going to get back to this as we get to uh, go back into Galatians chapter 3, chapter 4, and also uh, Romans, especially Romans 7, but we're going to do some uh, uh, working in and out of it. So that's, uh, this is a, a, a critical point as we move forward. So here we go. Let's be flexible about how, how we understand the world word law. It's not just prohibitions, authorization, assignment, but it is prohibition is one of them. Permission limitation, where you say, yes, you can go, but do it this way. So you have some limitations uh, uh, that, that go into it. So now we're looking at, again, one of the things that we look at in terms of law, and as I hear people read Romans 7, we think about it as a list of things to do. Can we live better. I remember a Sunday school class I was teaching where everybody was saying, well, what Jesus really did for us was show us a better way to live. Now, I quite agree that Jesus showed us a better way to live. But the problem here is when we see that as the list of things that we aren't going to do in order that we're going to gain God's uh, love. So if you look here now at Psalm chapter 8, this connects back to the uh, Genesis 1 and 2 passages that I was listing. And I'm 8, 3 to 8. When I look up at your heavens, the work of your fingers, at the moon and the stars you have set in place. Now remember this is Genesis 1, that power, uh, all the stuff that's happening before the humans are created. So then we go on. What is a frail mortal? Uh, the, uh, I believe the NIV uses what is man. Or what is humanity, that you should be mindful of him, a human being, that you should take notice of him. Yet you have made him little less than a god. Now, if you're in the NIV, that's going to be angels. Uh, if you're in the uh, New American Standard Bible, it's going to be a little less than God. Those are translation issues in there. I, I'm going to emphasize here, however, that the key point is that the status is high. This is not talking about a low status. This is not talking about uh, uh, little puny. This is a high status. 
You made him little less than a God, crowning his head with glory and honor. You make him master over all that you have made, putting everything in subjection under his feet. All sheep and oxen, all the wild beasts, the birds in the air, the fish in the sea, and everything that moves along uh, ocean paths. Now, one of the interesting things here, as I bring it up, is the the uh, Psalm 8 has what we call an envelope, that is an opening and closing statement that are the same. Lord our sovereign, how glorious is your name throughout the world. That comes both at the beginning and the end of the psalm. And that puts a point here is that in doing this, in doing this for humanity, God is displaying his glory. Now in Hebrews, this passage is going to be applied to Jesus. That's an important point, but it's something that we'll take on at, at another time. This honor is a glory given by God as we've seen there. And that is an action of, of what is God's purpose. When Paul comes in Romans 3 and says, we've all fallen short of God's glory, well, here is a thing of God, uh, in God's glory. Now, you ask the question, is, this, is the point here that we've been angry too many times today, and if we would just be angry a little less, we would meet God's glory? I'm going to suggest no, and I'm, going to, I'm suggesting that now, but not proving it, as we'll go through a lot more scriptures, that what God has for us is something that is beyond our counting, our imagining, our judging, anything like that. And that's both in terms of the holiness and in terms of the glory. And all of those are uh, things that God uh, legislates, shall we say, for us, that puts forward uh, uh, for us. And so that's an important point to see here. Now, let's look at that, what that means when God crowns with glory and honor. If you go back to Genesis 1, you know, you put everything in subjection. He says he's put the humanity uh, over all of nature. I've grabbed this, you know, picture of a manager. If you were hiring a manager for a business, you are not hiring somebody who simply applies a set of prohibitions or a set even of positive commands. You are getting somebody who puts some of themselves uh, into it. Now, of course, we're going to remember it, whatever we have in ourselves is also a gift of God. But nonetheless, this is more than uh, the following the checklist. All of us have been on technical support lines where you can tell that somebody is following a little flow chart. If they say this, say that. Uh, if they say this other thing, you know, here's another way. And you follow your flow chart, and if your answer doesn't fit into one of the little spaces on the flow chart, the con conversation goes south in a hurry. Management, having things put in subjection, having dominion over the earth, as in Genesis 1, uh, involves more than the, the simple view of the pro prohibitions uh, and positive detailed commands. So now I'm going to get a quote out of, we're following meditations on the letters of Paul. This is from page 113, and I'm putting it in here. No, I have not demonstrated this yet. And unless you've read meditations on the letters of Paul, you won't see where uh, Harold Weiss has demonstrated this yet. But nonetheless, uh, I'm going to say, give this quote because you're going to see it again. As far as Paul is concerned, salvation has always been dependent on God's initiative alone. And I think this ties quite correctly to Genesis 1. That is on grace. It is God who calls, who loves, who justifies. It was so with Abraham and the patriarchs, and it is so to this day. I've said something similar where I've said God has never had a plan that was not intended to produce a holy people. Uh, and at the same time, he's never had a plan that did not start uh, with grace, with what God uh, gives. So now I'm looking at the time and I'm running out. I'm going to recommend, I'm going to ask if we'll read before next week. Uh, Psalm 19, 
uh, Psalm 19 connects God's creative power and God's law giving. And there's an important point here we're going to do. One of the key elements of what is called Torah or law in the uh, Hebrew scriptures is the source of authority, the source of authority coming from God. And then there is a connection between who God is and our witness and who God is and the law for us and what the law does. Psalm 19 in poetic form covers a great deal of that ground. So if we read that uh, before next week, that will work, uh, uh, work out well. Thank you for joining me. I didn't see any comments, so didn't bring those in. I will uh, be posting a recorded version of this on the website. This one will remain available on Facebook. Uh, and uh, I will also be posting the uh, PowerPoint presentation uh, so that you can find any uh, links in there and so on. Uh, before I close, let me, uh, hold on just a second. Let me remind you that I blog Threads from Henry's Web. That is where I'll be posting any additional comments and materials on the study. Uh, and then also uh, videos and so on and related texts are going to be at the uh, Resources for Studying Paul. And I'll probably put a link to that into my uh, next uh, blog post on uh, Threads from Henry's Web. Thank you for joining me, or for watching, if you're watching this later. Uh, may God bless you. Lord, I thank you for those who have uh, listened, those who have watched, those who study your word. Bless them, uh, guide them through your Holy Spirit, and pour out your love and your grace on them. In Jesus' name, amen.